Welcome back to this master class on cancer. Just imagine you're sitting in the chair. Maybe you've been sitting in the chair. You are next, maybe next to a loved one. The doctor looks at you and said, you have cancer. What goes on in your mind? I can only guess. I can just share what we're going on in my mind, which would be fear, concern, confusion, all these things that go on. What do you do? Well, you're about to meet some people that are going to share what they did, how they got through it. And I'm smiling because they're genuinely funny. They're funny people. They took a moment that happened and they saw the humor in it. Now, this is not to downplay for you or anybody else. When you get cancer, it's not serious. Of course, it's serious. But just because it's serious doesn't mean we can't laugh at it. And just because we're laughing at it doesn't mean it's not serious. If some of these people look familiar, they're part of the You Just Have to Laugh family. You may have seen them in other episodes. They're going to share with you why you just have to laugh when going through cancer. I think you feel when you have something so life-threatening and serious that it's somehow not, um, not caring to laugh. It's, it's so inappropriate. But indeed, it, instead it's the opposite. That is that pressure release. How can you laugh? Life is serious. What are you talking about? It's nothing funny. When I was 38 years old, I felt a lump under my armpit uh -oh. and uh, knew that was a bad thing. Life is difficult not unfair. And went to the doctor and the first thing the doctor said was, well, I think that might be an infected sweat gland. And what my husband said was, wow, that's weird, you never work out. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Solzhenitsyn in his book, Cancer Ward, see he doesn't talk about a miracle or a spontaneous remission. He talked about having had cancer, self-induced healing. Fourteen years ago, my lovely wife decided to uh, leave me, and then I found out I had breast cancer. So July 9th, I had a mastectomy, and July 2nd, I got a divorce, so I like to think that I got rid of three boobs in two weeks. So I was had to figure out how to tell my sons, um, who were then so eight and six years old, what was going on. And we had been out of town, and while I was out of town, someone had stolen the radio out of my car and the boys were just crazy about that. They couldn't gotcha. believe somebody would do that. Yeah. So they were talking about that and I said, well you guys, I know you think that's crazy, but I have these bad cells in my breast and they're gonna have to take it off. And Adam said, mom, that's amazing. First they take your radio, <coughs> then they take your breast. <laughs> if you grow up with parents who give you models to live by, and our comedians, you know, who aren't afraid to laugh, you end up very different. So then Seth said, well, what do they do with all the breasts that they take off? So I said they put them in a room for men to come look at, of course. <laughs> because you then have mottos to live by. They teach you survival behavior. Dad was always funny and very clever. He had a gift with words. And uh, I can remember one day I was over at the courthouse and I was waiting for him to come off the bench to go to lunch. And so I was just sitting there. And uh, while he was still holding his hearing, he said, and let the record reflect that daughter number three is waiting in the wings for me so we can go to lunch. <laughs> That's just how he always was. We had, we had an MRI, okay? okay? Found all the cancer everywhere. He realized that he had cancer in every part of his body, especially the liver, and we all know how serious that is, and bone, every place except for one his lungs, and he says to my mom. He gave me this big smile and he said, well, I'm sure glad I didn't quit smoking. <laughs> and he smoked like a chimney until he couldn't hold a cigarette. And even after that, this is one of the funniest things, we'd go in there and he'd be in bed and he'd be pretending and he'd say, Ann, there's nothing there. Give me a match. And I'd say, okay, so I'm pantomiming, right? And he's going, <sighs> and he is smoking. He is pretending and enjoying a smoke, even though there was nothing in his hand, up until he was falling asleep. We were going to bed the night before I had my mastectomy, and I didn't know if they were gonna remove one breast or two breasts, and so I'm crying and I'm lying with him, and I look at him and I say, you know, are you gonna love me if they cut this breast off or if they cut off both breasts? And he looks right at me and he goes, 
They can cut that off and they can cut that off, but they better not cut that off and pointed. <laughs> yeah. He sure made it funny. We were embarrassed because we were laughing all the time. Really? <laughs> A little bit. You, you were embarrassed because you were laughing while he had cancer? We, we were embarrassed because we knew he was going to die and he was making us laugh all the time. <laughs> and it was fine because I, I suppose at some point you could say, that's not funny. Yeah. You know, I don't appreciate that. But the timing was perfect. Yeah. It did make me laugh. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he was saying, I'm going to be there for you and it's not going to matter. Dad would say something, we'd go out in the living room, we'd all just be doubled over and crying, we were laughing so hard, and the doorbell would ring and there would be some real sad couple, friend of ours with food, and they're, you know, real sad coming in, and we're in the living room, <laughs> we can't even talk to go to the door, and we would say, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, do you want to go? It's a weird balance because it's serious and you can die. So you don't want to play, play that down. So if somebody says to you, I have cancer, you don't want to go, that's no big deal. You can just laugh about it. Of course. Because that's not really true. That's not true. But you can survive or at least make it through the hard times by making fun of it. We weren't playing the role of the, you know, oh, he, oh how many days are left? Because we didn't feel that way because he didn't let us feel that way. You beat it. You've been right. cancer free for over 20 years. Right. And and you got a new set. And I got a new, yes, in 2000 I got a new set. You got a new That's, set. Yeah. And, yes. and more jokes, more kidding around about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. But the hard part was staying up all night because we never knew what he was going to do. He wasn't supposed to get out of bed. And so it's five minutes to five and I cannot stay awake. I mean, I'm just wiped. So. I fall asleep and I wake up three minutes later and he's gone out of the bed and he's not supposed to be walking he's got bone cancer everywhere and I go out in the hall and he's on all fours in the hall halfway between the bedroom and the bathroom I said dad is there anything I can do for you and he goes yeah you know what I need I need four casters <laughs> then you could just roll me down the hall to the bathroom I came home on a Friday night and said I've been to the doctor and I have Hodgkin's. And the first thing he said to me was, oh my goodness, I knew a guy in high school, a kid in high school, and he died of Hodgkin's. And his generosity, because he wasn't thinking about himself, but he wanted us to feel good. So he goes, let's all go out to dinner. And mom says, well, that might be kind of hard. He, knows he can't even move. That was on Friday. And by that Monday, we were headed to the doctor's. Let me out. <laughs> we laughed the whole time. And if we hadn't, I don't know what would have happened. She said, but it, honey, it's going to be kind of hard to go somewhere. And she goes, what can we do? And he said, let's just go mess up our own kitchen. So we get him in the kitchen and we're all there except for one, my sister Colleen, who lives in Dallas, and she'd just gone back. And he calls her. He says, I need to call Colleen. He gets her on the phone and he said, Colleen, I have some good news and bad news. The good news is I'm about to take a great trip and it's going to be wonderful and I'm really looking forward to it. But the bad news is I'm the only one who has a ticket. <laughs> She has breast cancer, probably caused from the radiation in 83. We don't know that, we don't care. The difference between before and after is before I'd always go and now I go but, but, but. You know, and one of those things. Terrible, terrible. I just remember standing there and he took his last breath. And then the hospice lady came in. She goes, you don't want to be here when they take him out. That was in 05, and then, I don't know, maybe, maybe three months ago, six months ago, I was diagnosed with skin cancer, and I can't think of a better couple to have it happen to than her and I. And we're going to get this one, too. We went to what we called the music room, and my sisters got out all this music because Dad loved singing, and we harmonized, and we got out all his favorite songs, and we just burst into song, loud song. Even the funeral wasn't sad. It just wasn't sad. We were laughing, we were singing, we were drinking our Baileys, 
and the paramedic was the running late. It was midnight, and he had to call home, and his wife accused him of being in a bar <laughs> instead of at work because of the background noise, and he came into us and said, you won't believe, somebody's going to have to say, I am working at the Mahoney's. I'm at work. I am not in a bar. Well, you know, this kid comes to see me, this strange little guy. His parents inflict me upon him to help him deal with the cancer that he has. So I was sitting there in Brain Tumor Clinic, and I had this idea that we need to play a trick on my radiologist. He actually changed the way I practice medicine. Sometimes you're in these brain tumor clinics for about three hours waiting for different doctors go in and out. One doctor comes in and I put on this pig nose and I say, you tell Dr. Young that he needs to explain some things to me. And so then we have, we have another doctor come in and, and I say, you tell Dr. Young he needs to explain some things to me. He walks in and he walks in from this direction and I'm in this direction I've got the pig nose on and I don't think he can see the string because I've got a bit of hair by now and I say Dr. Young I don't think you've completely told me all the side effects of radiation <laughs> and so when he told me that in that moment something shifted into place inside me and I knew Graham was giving me a life lesson. You can have fun in even the most tense situations. My father, he's always been a really funny guy ever since uh, he, he was a person who could always make fun of himself. He enjoyed making other people laugh. When he was about, I think he was 37, he was diagnosed with cancer and it was melanoma cancer and it, it was on his ear and they told him that they wanted to do some radical surgery. They would take off his ear, they'd take all the lymph glands underneath his neck out from under his arm. His, his ear was cut off, basically. They, they left him enough that he could hang his glasses on it, because he wore glasses. Um, but that's all he had, and all the rest was gone. And he always was worried about being disfigured. He'd always turn his head in pictures so that you wouldn't see that side. Um, but after a while, it became just that was dad. That was part of him. He used to joke about it. My, my mother used to say to people, he'd say, no, don't get her upset, because you know she'll bite your ear off. <laughs> and he'd turn and say, see, you know, see what happens when you... Imagine, at 18 years old, me sitting in a hospital room and in walks a doctor that says, you have a malignant brain tumor. And I said, what? You've got to be kidding me. I don't understand. And he said, why don't you understand? And I said, how can you have a brain tumor if you don't have a brain? <laughs> My folks and I laughed really hard. I looked at the doctor. He wasn't laughing at all. Instead, he jerked my parents out into the waiting room and said, I don't think David understands what's going on. And I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, oh, but he does understand. He made a choice. He knows exactly what's going on. This is how he chooses to deal with it. You better get on board. It's possible that you could offend somebody, um, but you can't worry about that. You know, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't get it. You can't wait to feel good till everybody gets it. You know, you carry a positive contagion, they're going to be people that are vaccinated. <laughs> Later on that evening, my girlfriend walks in and she wants to know what's going on. And so I said, well, I've got a malignant brain tumor. And they told me I probably wouldn't live until my next, to see my next birthday. And she, of course, fell apart and went home. And in going home, she talked to her mother extensively and they agreed after talking that maybe she shouldn't be around me right now because my brain tumor might be contagious. <laughs> and once again, <laughs> my response to that is, if she doesn't have a brain, she can't get a brain tumor. <laughs> Two days after David's surgery, the first day out of ICU, he's in his room. So I take little breaks out of the room sometimes just to get away. So I went downstairs in the cafeteria to get some coffee. And as I'm coming back up, I step on the elevator. And David's older sister, Debbie, is on the elevator. And when I turned, there's a big stretcher there. And her husband, Kevin, is laying on that stretcher. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, this isn't funny. I said, Kevin, get up off of there. And Kevin said, I can't. And he had a ruptured appendix and he was going to surgery. Well, you thought he was faking it. And I thought they were totally, I thought they were doing it to make him, they were going to roll it up to the room and make him. Kevin would come by my room and say, come on, it's time. Um, so we would, we would get out in the hallway. We both had IVs on poles, on rolling poles. 
and we would have IV races <laughs> around our floor. Now, did you encourage this, Mom? Absolutely. The day came when I got a certified letter from the hospital saying something was amiss. Mm -hmm. Turns out I had breast cancer, and I remember calling my dad on the phone and saying, Dad, I have breast cancer. I have to have a double mastectomy. And he said, well, that's okay, because you can't do anything with them anyway. You can't even type. <laughs> And I remember I was sitting there on the phone, I can't even type with them. Dad, you're right. What was I thinking? Let's get rid of them right away. I would see other people that I would use as an example that when something bad happened, they broke down. And that didn't do them, them or anyone around them any good. The time came up for my surgery. I wanted to have a goodbye booby party. <laughs> A what? Goodbye booby party. <laughs> so I gathered a bunch of my friends and we went out and we just had a blast. And I never laughed so hard in my life as everyone was saying goodbye to my boobies. A study was done by a student at University of South Florida, a graduate student. She gave two actors a comedy, Lucille Ball Desiarnez script, and then a tragedy. While acting, their blood was drawn. And that's what impressed me as a doctor. They're only acting. But what happens? Immune function goes up when you're laughing. Cortisol levels, stress hormone levels go down. When you're in the tragedy, the opposite. I learned a long time ago that the best thing in life to do was to make a choice about how you felt about it and how you reacted. So that being happy is a choice. If I start laughing in a crowd, everybody starts laughing. They don't know why I'm laughing. So we know this from studies with cancer patients. If you get them to laugh four times a day, they live longer. And that doesn't mean you give them a joke to read. You just say laugh. You start laughing, you change your chemistry. The joy of it is we don't remember cancer. We don't remember suffering. We don't remember the illness because he didn't allow it. He didn't allow anybody to think about anything except what makes us laugh. And it was a great gift. But I will never forget how good it felt to laugh. Come on, yeah, come on, that's great. How about when he goes on a trip? When, when, when I go out of town. He goes out of town, he takes a piece of me. He takes a part of me. My prosthesis goes with him, so, so I'm always with him. We laugh about that. What are you going to do? Cry? I did that a little bit here. Yeah, I'm that. done. <laughs> it's over. I told you, funny people. Just because it's serious doesn't mean we can't laugh at it. And just because we're laughing at it doesn't mean it's not serious. So why do you laugh through cancer? You saw what these people did, but there's a woman who told me a story that I did, that she came up and told me after I did a show for breast cancer patients. She said, David, I like a word with you. She takes me off to the side. She goes, my name's not important, but the story is. I'm 72 years old. After my mastectomy, I went to see my female doctor, and I said to my doctor, doctor, I'm just assuming, since I only have one breast now, I get 50% off on this visit. Is that true? <laughs> and I said, that's a great line, ma'am. Did your doctor laugh? She goes, I don't know, David. I didn't do it for her. I did it for me. That's why you do it. You do it for yourself as a way to get through it. Because you'll find in any time when you laugh at something that scares you, and you've heard me say this so many times, but this is so applicable here. When you laugh at what scares you, you now own it. It doesn't own you. Then after you laugh at it, you're rebooted, you feel better, and you can approach it with a little lighter feeling and not so heavy. That's why. You just have to laugh through cancer. We'll listen to each other at the next Master Class. Thanks for joining us.